Hi, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, we're very excited to have you all here. Um, um, I think people from truly all over the world have registered for this talk. So it's, it's truly amazing um, to see. And, and I'm sure that the conversation today is going to be um, very thought provoking and interesting. Um, given the, the, the variety of people that we have today. Um, so I'm Victoria, for those of you who don't know me, I'm one of the co-organizers and I want to welcome you to our second year, um, uh, the second year of um, In Search of Epistemic Justice, um, just to uh, reassert our mission a bit. Um, we are um, trying to address both in theory and practice, uh, epistemic inequality in the academy, specifically in the humanities. And uh, one way of doing that for us is to bring everybody here and to bring speakers uh, from all over the world uh, who are um, addressing these issues. Uh, I want to uh, remind the people who are present that um, sure we have lectures, we have roundtables, but we also have workshops. So if everybody, every, every and if anyone, I'm sorry, is interested in submitting um, a workshop proposal, an idea for presenting work in progress, uh, we would love to organize the workshop for you. Uh, and so just send us an email and we will get in touch with you. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to move on to today's presentation. So we're hosting Professor Jonathan Timaconum uh, from the University of Pretoria and the Conversational School of Philosophy, um, University of Calabar. And the title of his talk today, if you don't know yet, is Supple, Super Alternism and Reverse Coloniality is Epistemic Injustice Possible Within the Frame of Thought? Or I rather, I should say the frame of thought. Um, so uh, our host today uh, teaches in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Pretoria, South Africa. He is also a senior research fellow at the Center for Interdisciplinary and Intercultural Philosophy at Harkos University of Tübingen in Germany. He, thought, he taught at the University of Calabar, Nigeria for several years and is a second generation member of the prestigious Calabar School. He was a research associate at the University of Johannesburg and his teacher and research interests cover the areas of African philosophy, logic, intercultural philosophy, environmental ethics, philosophy of religion, and postmodern decolonial thought. He is a major proponent of the conversational approach to philosophy, and he articulated and defined the system of conversational thinking, um, which is uh, a method of philosophy and a system of logic called Ezumezu uh, that serves as its ground. Um, he's also the African philosophy area editor of the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy and the editor of Philosophia Theoretica, Journal of African Philosophy, Culture, and Religions. Um, Professor Chimakonon has mentored uh, many young African academics. He's also the co author of a new book, African Metaphysics, Epistemology, and New Logic The Colonial Approach to Philosophy. And he is the principal investigator in the University of Pretoria, RDP, and UCDP funded research projects that will decoloniality through controversial thinking. Um, so uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Timakonen and, uh, um, and thank you all for, for being here. Thank you very much, uh, Victoria, Angelo and um, everyone in the organizing team. I am happy to be here uh, to talk on the topic, super alternism and reverse coloniality. Is epistemic injustice possible within the frame of thought? Uh, in the next 30, 35 minutes or thereabouts, I hope to be able to sum up the ideas in this talk. So let me begin. Okay, uh, people know what epistemic justice is. It's been 
uh, it's a hotly discussed topic in the literature. Uh, but by way of a uh, summary to give us a pedestal to take off in this talk, um, let me rehash again the ideas that will plot the trajectory of this talk. Epistemic injustice in free own words uh, is a kind of wrong done to someone specifically in their capacity as a knower. I will explain this as we move on. But then there is epistemic justice that people are now talking about, and uh, which is the theme of today's uh, uh, this event. How can we find epistemic justice amidst epistemic injustice? So what then is epistemic justice? Epistemic injustice, well, simply could entail a situation where uh, uh, there is, you know, absence, so to speak, of credibility deficits and even intelligibility deficits, as the case may be. But where epistemic injustice has occurred, uh, we can as well, people are talking about a way of restoring epistemic justice and by overcoming epistemic injustice. So correcting such a wrong done would, ju would just be one way of uh, overcoming epistemic injustice. And people who hold this view uh, have now attracted the tag of in principle optimists with those who believe that we can overcome epistemic injustice. And um, uh, quite a number of literature uh, have been published on, on that subject, um, proposing ways that we can overcome epistemic injustice in, in different topics in different areas, as the case may be. Miranda Africa herself is also an in principle optimist to a point because she believes that uh, that's this kind of epistemic injustice that we can overcome. And um, he describes this as a sort of moment to moment um, occurrences of epistemic injustice that these things can be overcome. And I'll get to details of um, how she says that uh, we can actually overcome these moment to moment occurrences of epistemic injustice. In her own words, of course, she tries to uh, identify two types of epistemic injustice, the one call, she calls uh, testimonial epistemic injustice, and the other she describes as a hermeneutical epistemic injustice. So if we plan to or wish to overcome testimonial epistemic injustice, according to Frika, uh, that would, what that will entail is uh, that we find a way to neutralize whatever prejudice that is causing the credibility de deficits for testimonial, testimonial epistemic injustice. And for the hermeneutical type, uh, we can try to eradicate you know, the background hermeneutical marginalization that renders the deficit of intelligibility unjust. Um, uh, in a simple way of putting it, um, uh, uh, both approaches will entail restoring what was denied for the testimonial variant and creating what was missing for the hermeneutical variant. I don't want to go into the detail of explaining what testimonial and the hermeneutical um, just injustice, epistemic injustices uh, are. Uh, however, this approach that Africa uh, gestures towards, and which some other uh, scholars who have been the in principle optimists have been floating around, uh, has a weave of restorative justice attached to that uh, it, it needs. Um, uh, the question, however, is um, will such an approach work for epistemic? Uh, injustice. Restorative justice, for example, uh, tries to uh, restore justice where none exists 
by bringing together victims and perpetrators, talking issues over uh, making restitutions where necessary, as the case may be, uh, to restore what was uh, destroyed or damaged or uh, the wrong that was created. My question, therefore, is, is, is it that simple that we can adopt this approach for um, epistemic injustice? My answer is no. Uh, it's not that simple. Epistemic justice is a different type of animal altogether. Um, it's not like other type of injustices that can be addressed using this approach of restorative justice. Um, for example, the legal type of injustice. If um, we have someone or a group of people living in a community, let's assume that um, the dams dried up, water not running, government has a responsibility to distribute primary goods, which, which includes water, and someone who just doesn't like the people living in this particular community who has prejudice against them, uh, continues to ensure that they are passed over uh, the distribution of water at such a critical time, all right? Now, this is what these people are entitled to by law. And if we happen to find out, we can move to restore uh, justice in this legal sense by sending in a truckload of water, or many trucks as the case may be, and, um, and all will be well. What about the natural type of justice? Let's assume that people have come to interview for a job and someone uh, actually excelled more than the rest. And the panel recommended that this is the person that should be given the job. But the captain of that uh, company, you know, for some reason, feels that the person in question is perhaps not pretty enough uh, to the company's standard and decides not to give that person the job. If we find out, uh, and push for justice, uh, we can get uh, 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 offer the person the job and justice will be restored naturally. But these, is, uh, these examples deal with denial of something external, like good services, opportunities, as the case may be. Epistemic justice does not deal with this type of external goods. Okay, we can redress injustice of this kind by restoring what was denied or missing, and we can determine the accurate measure for each. We can determine the number of truck of water we can send into that community we, we precisely. But in terms of epistemic injustice, can we determine uh, the, 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 the sort of things that are involved that we want to restore or create, as the case may be? So, here we go. Epistemic injustice is a different category. It's in a different, it's a different ca uh, category altogether. It deals with the denial absence of something metaphysical. All right. When uh, there is a credibility deficit to someone's um, uh, being, we are talking about the dignity of that entity as a human being, uh, subjugated, subtracted, uh, denied, um, as the case may be. It's not something we can scoop up and, and then give to that person, uh, someone who has suffered credibility deficit. How do we exactly ensure that uh, the person, uh, justice is restored by correcting the wrong, by correcting ourselves and say, okay, all right, apologies, uh, just like what happened in the United States recently this um, October, when the... Um, the city council president, I think in Los Angeles, uh, Nuri Martinez, a uh, recording leaked where she uttered a lot of uh, despicable racist remarks. And um, when the recording came out, one year after, uh, she, of course, condemned her words, repented and all that. The question is, two things really, uh, has she changed in her mind? Has the prejudice in her mind, has, has it gone away? And, um, uh, the, the those that she has hurt by her words and prejudices, uh, that her it's a trickle repentance, uh, does it in any way assuage the pains that these people feel? So, 
epistemic in Carson was wrong done to people in their capacities as knowers. These capacities are intellectual, cognitive, and are those metaphysical. These are not things we can stretch our hands and, 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 and pick out and grab and have a scoop of it and say, this is what it is. This has been denied. All right, we return it. It doesn't work that way for <clears throat> the category of injustice that epistemic injustice represents. So, how can we redress this type of injustice? And how can we know that our approach will be adequate? It's a, it's a serious question. And he throws a spanner in the works, you know, in any attempt geared towards overcoming epistemic injustice. Uh, that spanner specifically is a methodological problem with three variants. The first one asks the question, how can we redress this type of injustice for someone who has suffered credibility deficit? How can we redress it? All right. Um, it's not easy for someone who has uh, caused that, deflated that person's um, uh, personality to come and say some other wonderful things. It's not enough to heal the pain in the heart of the person who has suffered injustice. And there is no way of knowing that the prejudice in the mind of the speaker has been eliminated. Okay. So the first variant of this methodology problem is the impossibility variant. It's literally impossible for us to uh, redress this type of injustice in, uh, for someone who has suffered credibility deficit. And um, number two, how can we practically eliminate the prejudice in the perpetrator's mind? This is the impracticability variant. Our approach, our practical, will they really work uh, to the effect to the point of eliminating the prejudice in the perpetrator's mind, because it's important. That is where the, uh, the, the that is the source of the, of epistemic injustice itself. Number three, can we know that our approach will be adequate for someone whose sense of self has been deflated? This inadequacy variant. Whatever approach we design, whatever mechanism we come up with uh, to overcome, um, epistemic injustice. How can we know that such an approach would be adequate um, uh, for someone whose sense of self has been deflated? So now this methodological problem is a very big issue uh, as far as uh, our attempt to design a program for overcoming epistemic injustice is concerned. Hegemonic behaviors like epistemic injustice uh, the, these behaviors have antecedent cognitive conditions that necessitate them. And uh, those antecedent uh, cognitive conditions, uh, as I have identified them, include number one, frame of thought, number two, reverse coloniality, and number three, superalternism. Uh, these antecedent conditions are systemic, <clears throat> and I'll explain this. And um, Epistemic injustice targets the metaphysical property in victims, the dignity, the humanity in someone, uh, someone's mentality, as the case may be. So even if it were possible to overcome it within the same system that created it, how can our approach ever be adequate? So these are two uh, issues that uh, actors who work to design a program for overcoming epistemic injustice that must grapple with. Now, to make these problems much more obvious, um, let me bring in super -time studies. And uh, by way of a simple de definition, it's a decolonial investigation of the antecedent cognitive conditions to superior mentality, the implications of the letter on society and the victimhood it confers on those who manifest it. It's a new area of study that um, um, uh, Bjorn Freta and I are developing. And uh, we have published essays and given talks uh, on it. Um, uh, but before I proceed, it's important to again indicate that uh, some of these antecedent cognitive conditions might be more insidious problems than epistemic injustice itself that we are really trying to break the bank to solve and address. All right. And I will explain that uh, in the uh, slides to come. 
to indicate to us that what lies behind epistemic injustice might be uh, might pose greater threats than epistemic injustice itself, and might require us to find a way to address them in a way of uh, cutting off the head of the snake, and um, of course, and neutralizing its uh, effects, its uh, poisons, and what have you. So, Freta, uh, you just say reference some references are provided there to the works of Bjorn Freta. Uh, who has um, uh, contributed some wonderful concepts in the development of this uh, area of study uh, that we have called super OTAN studies. And of course mine, you can see the link of a YouTube talk that I, I gave at University of um, Fortaire uh, only last month. Now, but to understand um, these problems and how insidious that they are, we have to understand what a system is, and then what what I mean by frame of thought. Uh, if you look at figure one there, it's like a pyramid, and it has three layers. They are the base. You have logic and ontology. At the middle, you have methods, and at the tip, you have theories. Uh, I take this to be the structure of a system, irrespective of whichever field that's um, uh, you want to think about to do system thinking. And figure two uh, provides the skeleton of what is in figure one, all right? So what you have at the base in figure one uh, is the foundational as component of a system. And what you have in the middle is the architectural, the structural uh, part of a system. And then at the tip is the doctrinal, the ideological theories, principles, and what have you. So uh, to understand why this, uh, logic and ontology form the foundation of a system, uh, it's important for us to know that logic deals with laws that govern reasoning. And ontology deals with realities involved in the reasoning process. So you need both of them, uh, and, and, and not more, both of them to form the frame of thought as you have at the top of that slide, frame of thought is the foundation of a system and it's made up of the logical and the ontological. And then in the middle, you have methods that deal, uh, methods that deal with different ways of applying the laws of logic that lie at the foundation of a system. And on top of it, the theories, principles, and what have you, that actually deal with different ways of organizing ideas along specific methods. And every system can have multiple methods but every system in a system can only have one logic because logic um, encompasses the principles of intelligibility. And to have uh, different systems of logic um, in a system uh, would create a situation of conflict of thought. So having given us the base understanding of what a system is and what a frame of thought is. The frame of thought is what lies at the foundation of a system made up of logic and ontology. That gives us frame of thoughts. Both of them shape method and they go on to shape theory, okay? Or ideas, ideologies, and what have you um, in, in a system. So with this understanding of a system and frame of thought, let us pro uh, proceed to identify the type of frame of thought that really shapes epistemic injustice, all right? And I say that it's the bivalent frame of thought. The frame of thought is bivalent if given any field of action, one of opposed variables, not both can hold at a given time, okay? So epistemic injustice, injustice or epist epistemic justice or epistemic injustice, but not both, all right? In a truly bivalent system, uh, so the laws of excluded middle and contradiction defined by violence as, and, and of course, the principle of determinism. Now let us have a depiction of the antecedent cognitive conditions. Remember, these antecedent cognitive conditions somehow correspond to what you have in the different parts of a system. As you have it on top of here, frame of thoughts, the foundation, reverse coloniality, is somewhat architectural and methodological, and super is ideological, corresponding to what is in the middle and what's it's on top. Now, uh, these 
antecedent cognitive conditions. When we talk about epistemic injustice, we lose sight of these antecedent cognitive conditions because they are metaphysical and they are antecedental. Um, and this diagram before us demonstrates to us sometimes why um, it's not readily obvious for us to observe that when we have epistemic injustice or a case of epistemic injustice, that it is not just the immediate prejudice that we can point to. There are things that there are conditions that necessitate uh, lead to the formation of that prejudice that led to epistemic injustice itself. And but then you look at this dotted line here. All right. This is like a veil. And I borrow Innocent Asus's concept of phenomenon of concealment. Okay. Um, uh, that deals with things that hamper and prevent reason to assess uh, the the sort of knowledge that is supposed to assess. It could be our passions. It could be the, um, the remoteness of the, uh, the, 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 the matter in point, whether it's too metaphysical or technical, as the case may be. In this case, um, frame of thought is technical. Uh, uh, reverse coloniality and super are also metaphysical. And these phenomenal concealment prevents us from seeing that these three ultimately necessitate the type of prejudice that give birth to epistemic injustice. And um, if we do not see this, that is when we take the matter of epistemic injustice as its face value and attempt to appropriate all kinds of um, uh, approaches such as that of restorative justice to address it, believing that it is that simple. But it is not. It's a complex system. A frame of thoughts, like I have indicated, when it is bivalent, as I have shown in the preceding slide, that the frame of thought that necessitated epistemic injustice ultimately is bivalent. And bivalent frame of thought um, um, try to uh, define reality in two lopsided way in which one is highlighted and the other is residualized, just like we have truth and false, you know, and uh, we have male, female, and then we have sexism, all right? We have superior, inferior, we have racism. We have rich and poor, we have classism, and all kinds of problems. All of that type of mindset begin with this frame of thoughts that shape them, all right? And this frame of thought shapes reverse coloniality, which is an ideology. Okay, ideology commonly found um, uh, in people uh, 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 that have uh, inflated sense of themselves, okay, thinking of themselves to be of more important than they actually, you know, are and all that. And then you have of course, reverse coloniality in this sense, we can contextualize it in different ways. Uh, one uh, prominent way we can contextualize it is what happens between the colonizer and the colonized, all right? And um, then we have super alternism, which is superior mentality. When reverse coloniality gives people that sense of inflated sense of themselves, it begins to uh, drive them towards accumulating beliefs that affirm that type of thinking. And those beliefs eventually get codified into an ideology called super alternism that is superior, superiorist mindset or superiorist mentality. So these things eventually pro are the progenitors. They are the primordial causes of the type of prejudice that lead to all forms of marginal thinking, including epistemic injustice. So to address epistemic injustice, one must take, provide and uh, develop measures that can neutralize or adequately take care of all of this. But remember that a bivalent system of thinking is deterministic. And so if you wish to uh, produce something that is opposed, opposite of what um, uh, it has produced, then you would definitely run into a contradiction and that would not be possible. So the big questions that here is that is epistemic injustice possible within the frame of thoughts that created it? In other words, is epistemic justice possible 
within the same frame of thought that produces epistemic injustice? Or is epistemic injustice possible within the same frame of thought that produces epistemic justice? Having demonstrated that the uh, frame of thought that produces epistemic injustice is bivalent, as I have indicated, then it is not possible, essentially, unless we are um, violating the principles of that bivalent system. And I will show that momentarily. So, but in principle, optimists believe that we can overcome epistemic injustice. They take this thing as surface value and um, without really knowing the antecedental conditions that uh, necessitate epistemic injustice and the influence frame of thought plays uh, in that. Frika, for one, is more cautious. Okay, she believes that moment to moment overcoming of epistemic injustice is possible, but is why that conception may be impossible. All right, I agree. However, she did not tell us why that is the case. Frika also admits that undoing the intrinsic insult uh, is likely unachievable by credibility correction alone. However, uh, she did not formulate a theory for it, thereby leaving a gap in the literature. Other then others that um, go by the tag of in principle pessimists have reservations that, oh, that epistemic injustice could be overcome. All right. And uh, this suggests that perhaps we should think of going beyond um, um, the system of the system in which epistemic injustice is produced. All right. And I have two examples there in literature. Uh, Vasileva and Ayala Lopez suggest that suggest structural thinking into the psychology that instigates discriminatory practices. And um, uh, Loreto Pocholi also suggests thinking outside of the Eurocentric paradigm, which sustains epistemic injustice. These are all in line with my thinking, as I believe I'm, I am an in principle pessimist, as they are. However, they did not formulate a theory for it, hence the gap in literature. And my attempt to formulate such a theory that demonstrates uh, by uh, the figures I've shown before, how three antece antecedent cognitive conditions necessitate epistemic injustice and why um, it is a product of a bivalent frame of thought. And any attempt geared towards uh, overcoming it must aspire to go beyond that system because uh, such will not be found in that system. And I demonstrate, the, offer this final demonstration before I wrap it up. You know, think of what is before you as um, a depiction of frame of thought, all right? And, um, uh, and how they necessitate uh, epistemic, in, uh, it necessitate, bivalent frame of thought necessitates epistemic injustice. And uh, of course, what uh, though uh, people like Frika are doing, their optimism, what it amounts to in practice, what they're actually doing. So look at the first part of this um, <clears throat> um, structure. It is the normal frame, the normal bivalent frame. All right. And look at look inside of it, you see two dots, all right, separated by this dotted vertical line. Now it, this one. This first dot that is inside the frame is, let's say, uh, it is epistemic justice. And then let's look at the dot that is inside the frame, but on the side, separated by the vertical line, as epistemic injustice. Why this one is epistemic justice? All right. So that's this binary opposition that is signified by this dotted line. That is a typical normal bivalent. Um, a structure of thoughts. And however, in an attempt to overcome epistemic injustice and the optimism that in principle optimists, you know, um, uh, have, they try to breach this wall. This dotted line is the wall of determinism. And when they breach it, this bivalent frame ceases to be the norm normal, a transition to this one on the right side. The anomalous frame. It is no longer bivalent frame, and and what you have there is you have two dots within in the inside frame representing epistemic injustice and epistemic justice. 
Okay, forming binary. This time, however, not opposition, but complementarity, complementation. That is why Prika believes that moment to moment, uh, epistemic justice is possible to redress occurrences of moment to moment epistemic um, injustices. Um, uh, she believes that epistemic injustice can be done and can be undone. This is what explains that. And it's an anomalous bivalent frame. It's not the normal bivalent frame. So in that instance, the approach uh, provided is problematic. That methodology is problematic um, and, and all that. So uh, back to the big, big question, is epistemic justice possible within the same frame of thought that produces epistemic injustice? You know, from the preceding discussion, my answer is no. But even if it were possible, no approach would be adequate, given the metaphysical nature of what uh, the uh, epistemic injustice, the problem of epistemic injustice causes. Hence, there is a methodological problem that impedes the attempt to overcome epistemic injustice, and it points to more insidious problems, uh, because these are the things that, that shape the way we think. And so finally, therefore, um, uh, epistemic justice is simply not possible within a bivalent frame of thought that creates epistemic injustice, unless there is a methodological sabotage, which is what I believe the optimists are uh, orchestrating. So we, in essence, let me point out the methodological sabotage that they orchestrate. Number one, the correct credibility deficit without cor correcting interesting, intrinsic insult. All right? The correct intelligibility deficit for the test, for the hermeneutical type without correcting existing hot. And finally, they overcome moment to moment epistemic injustice without overcoming it in its wider conception. Okay, so ultimately, um, it is impossible to overcome um, epistemic injustice within the same bivalent frame of thought that processes it. We have to go outside of it. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you so much, um, Professor Timaconum for that extremely well-structured and clear presentation. Um, so uh, we are going to have uh, two respondents first, and then we will go to um, uh, a Q&A. So we'll start with Nicole Bess. Hello, thank you so much, Victoria. Thank you, Jonathan, uh, Professor Tinakon. Um, it was, it was, it was, it's such an interesting paper, and I'm very sympathetic to the, um, the idea of going back to the foundations of logic uh, to then uh, to then examine epistemological problems. I find that like something that very rarely do we dare to do, and I think it's very productive. So absolutely, in terms of the approach, I find this um, uh, very um, fruitful or opening of a, of a bunch of possibilities. So thank you so much. It was a, a fantastic read. Um, I have a few questions and I don't want to take up too much time because I think discussion it would 50 and more people is what we, we should focus on. But um, one of my questions is a more punctual one, which has to do with the question of super alternism. So it seems in your structure, if I have it in my head right, um, we go from logic and ontology to methods to theories. Right and super alternism is the theory that we uh, are worried about. That, that 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 is the problem here. Okay. Yes. And it seems to be that the step it's just a step before or the first condition of possibility behind epistemic injustice. Right. It, everything else is also behind it, but that's the, the the one that's right before it. And it is um, a question. You you say that it's a doctrine a doctrinal factor or a, a question of belief. It's the beliefs codified in our thought. And you know, just a question of, uh, a precise question about this is, it, it seems to me to be too volitional or too conscious with respect to what Fricker is pointing to. So maybe is, is Fricker work, working already or trying to work already at the methods kind of uh, level? Because um, the question of belief is not, I don't know, I wonder, it's really a question. Uh, do I need to consider myself, consider, not, not somewhat uh, have the logic that will require that to be the case, but do I need to consider myself superior to discount somebody's testimony? 
and even more so in, with, epi, with their hermeneutic injustice, uh, is it a question of belief that I hold? So that's one uh, question of uh, at what point of this, this tripartite structure that you gave us should we situate the critique? And that's one bit. The other question instead is larger and, and um, I hope not too pessimistic um, in a way, but I, it, I, 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 ha I have a lot of hope for this model. But the question is, does epistemic injustice always happen in binary ways? Is it always due to a binary or what you call a two-valued logic? Um, is this, does this embrace the whole of the phenomenon or um, are there things that escape that, right? Um, even uh, a kind of a follow-up question to that, there seems to be now a phenomena um, of non-binary logic at work in, in politics. I, I find them here and there. We see them with post-truth, for example, places where A and not A are possible, places where um, uh, the opposition is put in question in a way. But that doesn't necessarily seem to match um, you know, it's, first of all, it's not a good guys necessarily. And also it definitely doesn't solve the problem of epistemic injustice. It is non-binary, but it does, but it entails other forms of epistemic violence, I find. So um, I was wondering if you think that, that going back to the logic and, and finding non-binary or non-two-valued models um, uh, will really, um, is the answer or is one of the answers? I suppose it's a question of how you approach this. Um, yes, and finally, just uh, you mentioned delusion in your paper. Uh, you mentioned the delusion of the reverse coloniality, um, and so I was wondering how you understand that. Is it really a question of like almost an illness? Because there seems to be a pathological element to it in how you write about it, like a bit like um, Ashil Mbembe also talks about it in that way. Uh, how just how do you think about it? Because that's something I'm interested in, and I would love your take. But that's a, a, a selfish question from me. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. Just for a second, Angela, do you want to ask questions too, or should we uh, let Professor Tim McConnell answer first? I prefer to address these ones before okay. I forget some of them. Sure. Okay, thank you very much, um, Nicole, uh, for those um, very uh, exciting questions that you have raised. Uh, the first one, uh, in a simple way, is asking, you know, how does my or someone's, you know, accumulated belief uh, translate to uh, acts of epistemic injustice? Um, thoughts inform action, all right? And that does not mean that human beings do not act without thoughts. Of course they do. But sometimes, even when people act, without direct, um, uh, without having directly uh, thought about it, they again are acting on the basis of accumulated beliefs over time, uh, consciously, whether they are conscious of it or not. And um, uh, epistemic injustice is a form of marginal thinking, it's a thinking uh, that drives at establishing uh, negating orderness, as a matter of, as a kind of thinking that drives actors to negate orderness, because they want to affirm their ego, they want to affirm themselves uh, to have some form of special attributes that the orderness that they are trying to uh, negate do not, uh, 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 does not possess. So, uh, on the first value, it might not be obvious where and how these type of thinking, you know, develops, but uh, and that is what my theory that takes care of, in, of course, in Sproton studies that I situated it, that tries to identify antecedental conditions to epistemic injustice uh, by going beyond that veil, that phenomenon of concealment that uh, hampers and prevents us from really knowing where uh, this type of mindset comes from. So yes, uh, the frame of thought when it's bivalent, 
we want to look at reality and everything around us in, in, in binary way and binary opposition. And binary opposition is notorious for being lopsided and divisive. And um, then reverse coloniality um, derived from, of course, is a concept I coined. Uh, I, 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 I attract its mutation from coloniality, uh, which is um, uh, an ideology uh, that developed as a master troop of colonialism, inflicting on those who were formerly colonized, their descendants, uh, these uh, deflated sense of themselves. So reverse coloniality, I track this mutation, uh, is the opposite of it. It's an inflated sense of oneself, where one thinks or uh, imagines themselves to be higher and bigger and stronger and powerful than they actually are. And, um, and this form of thinking, again, begins to lead to all kinds of beliefs. One, pick up, one picks up from, from here and there, interactions with people, experiences into society, some personal um, interact, uh, uh, um, uh, imaginations. And these eventually accumulate, and these beliefs get codified into an ideology. Uh, called super organism, uh, ultimately superiorist mindsets. And one with that, once one gets to that level, then it becomes possible for that person to become an arbiter, a, a purveyor of all kinds of marginal form of thinking, including epistemic injustice, okay? Without knowing it and where it's coming from. My job was to demonstrate how it comes about. And your second question says, is epistemic injustice always The suspense. Oh. You know, there's something that results from this thinking. And by Professor, violent, I don't know if uh, this happened to everybody. Is, um, divisive. Uh, Professor, sorry. I think did it yeah. did it break for everybody the communication? Yes. Um you you, you were just saying uh, your second question. Um mm -hmm. and, and then it just um, um yeah, it okay. got okay. Okay, so um uh your second question about if you see whether epistemic injustice is always something that results from a form of binary thinking. And I say, yes, it is. Because um, and, and we have to know the type of binary. There is binary. I identify two types of binary in my talk here. There's binary opposition, uh, which is, uh, which of course we can trace back into uh, literature. And there is binary complementarity, uh, a concept that was developed uh, by members of the Calabar School. Uh, and so it's a form of binary, but not complementary. It's a binary uh, opposition. And binary opposition is notorious for being divisive and lopsided. Okay? Uh, and that is why um, epistemic injustice is something that can be traced to the frame of thought that is bivalent and binary. Okay, so then thirdly, you ask, can a non-binary model work? Yes. Okay, uh, the two actors I cited who, uh, who suggest we should be able to go beyond the system that uh, creates epistemic injustice to find ways of overcoming it. Uh, and I went ahead to create such a theory. Um, uh, what I did not do, uh, however, is to um, develop a non-binary model, perhaps a trivalent tri model, that I believe that can work in overcoming epistemic injustice when appropriately situated outside of a bivalent frame of thought. I did not go to that point, but I believe it's something that uh, harbors more promise than the current um, attempts being made within binary systems. And then uh, fourth, you ask is uh, reverse coloniality, a form of an illness. I think uh, uh, it is, and many, uh, uh, colonial uh, scholars have identified it as such. Um, Franz Fanon, in his uh, The Wretched of the Earth, tried to talk of what he calls colonized intellectual when he tried to describe those uh, African intellectuals who were educated in the West during colonial time and then they returned to their uh, home countries. He says that they, they, are, they represent the greatest danger in the uh, decolonization process because uh, their mindsets, okay, their mindset uh, has been structured 
through their colonial education uh, in that same fashion. And, and, and when they become teachers or uh, presidents or leaders or uh, those who control institutions and what have you, uh, they do to those under them exactly the same type of colonial violence that has been done them in their uh, um, uh, period of education in the West, whether they are aware of it or not. You know, so that suggests that is a kind of a mental issue, but somebody that clearly presents it as a mental uh, issue is um, the Nigerian philosopher and thinker um, uh, by the name, uh, what's that his name, but the concept he used what the concept was colonialysis. And he says that it is a psychological problem where you have these, uh, people who have been educated in the West or educated in Africa by those who were educated in, in the West, believing in these uh, uh, type of bivalent divisive binary, uh, sustaining the deflation of the, their, themselves and those of their uh, people, and then uh, subscribing to the superiority of ideas, culture, and peoples uh, who are from um, the formerly colonial uh, power, uh, uh, colonizing territories and what have you. He says it's, a, it's a colonialism, it's, it's, this is of the mind. And he, he follows them everywhere they go and um, uh, uh, undermines uh, every well-meaning ideas that people come up with in the circle where they, they are. So yes, and I believe that it is a disease of the mind. When someone uh, in the concept of reverse coloniality has an inflated sense of themselves, you know, believing uh, that they are larger than they actually are, bigger than they actually are, more powerful than they actually are, um, believing that they are superior when they are not. <clears throat> you know, what do you call that? It's a form of delusion. And um, psychologically, you know, those are, you know, mental uh, issues, but the ones that have come down through systems of education that are just not balance or that are bad in themselves. Thank you, Nicole. Well, thank you very much. And I so look forward to further discussions and readings about the the alternative, the the non uh, the non-binary. That's absolutely fascinating to me. And also it made me think of like um the logic of mythical thought in Levi Strauss, all that, uh, all those possibilities that have been described here and there. So yeah, I, I'm really excited. Thank you so much. Yes, there is already a debate happening in the chat, but we are going to let Angelo speak first and then we will move on to um, audience questions. Thank you, Victoria. Can everybody hear me well, correctly? It's fine. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Jonathan, for this thought provoking communication. It, it was incredibly inspiring and rich. And um, as Mikol, uh, I do appreciate a lot your perspective and your fundamental questioning. I, I think um, that you are raising some very important questions. I, I see your discussion of the cognitive antecedent conditions of epistemic injustice as part of the critical reflections that seek to understand the structural aspects of epistemic injustice. And this is, um, in my opinion, an indispensable line of research because it affects precisely the remedies to be adopted to question epistemic injustice. So th thank you again for bringing this perspective here today. Um, I, have a few, I have a few questions and thought for you, which I advance here in the spirit of encouraging conversation. Um, of uh, one question um, I have concerns your conceptualization of the frame of thought. Um, this concept of yours interested me a lot because I too try to think about the more structural aspects that condition our perceptions and our acting in the world. Uh, for my part, I have tried to talk about this sometimes through the notion of epistemic territory other times through the notion of symbolic institution following the phenomenologists Merleau-Ponty uh, or Marc Richier. Um, you said that you understand the frame of thought as the systematic imbrication of logic and ontology, right? So mm -hmm. my question concerns 
how you understand the ontological component. You said that this deals with the realities involved in, in reasoning processes. Uh, what are for you these realities? For example, um, is individual affectivity part of this reality? And what about the symbolic level of human life? Is this a part of the ontological component? In particular, I, I, I'm interested in how you conceive of the relationship between the symbolic level and the ontological level. Um, is the frame of thought something static or does it constantly change according to our symbolic life? Uh, our cultural productions, because the ontological component is also directly influenced by our symbolic activity. So this is this is one um, question. Um, another point is about your thesis on superalternism as a direct cognitive antecedent of epistemic injustice. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. It seems to me that in order to talk about superalternism as you do, it is necessary to identify a perpetrator of epistemic injustice and then to consider superalternism as the direct, direct cognitive antecedent for that perpetrator in committing that precise act of epistemic injustice, right? So um, it seems to me that this description might work very well for testimonial injustice, but I am not uh, sure that it works for all cases of hermeneutical injustice. Hermeneutical injustice is a very complex phenomenon, and I think we, we need much more work to describe its dynamics. Epistemologists often argue that epistemic humility is needed to remedy uh, hermeneutical injustice. That is, in cases where the hearer thinks that what the speaker is saying does not make, make much sense, instead of diminishing the speaker's epistemic contribution, they should take a step back and ask themselves precisely whether there is not a problem of intelligibility at stake and try to tune in as much as possible to what the speaker is, say, is trying to say. So in such cases, superalternism might have uh, very good relevance here. The, the point is that not all forms of hermeneutical injustice w work this way. Um, here, it is the difficulty of comprehension that puts uh, one on alert. It is the non-comprehension experienced by the here um, that gives rise to the doubt that there is a problem of intelligibility and that allows the hearer to identify themselves, identify themselves as a possible perpetrator of the injustice, one who has to apply epistemic humility. So, um, but often when we understand something, we think uh, we understand it correctly, right? And if we have no clues that impede our understanding, we do not doubt our perception. That is among the various possibility of human understanding, is that of unknowingly misrepresenting without any clue telling us that we are altering the, the epistemic contribution of the speaker. I have tried to theorize this phenomenon as epistemic obliteration in my work on, on translation. Um, most of the time that epistemic obliteration occurs, we are not aware of it nor do we have any clue that we are operating such a form of, of obliteration. So I, I'm not sure that superalternism can be considered a direct cognitive antecedent in cases where hermeneutical injustice is linked to epistemic obliteration, for example. And perhaps even in the case of hermeneutical injustice of a cognitive rather than communicative kind, things could be more complex. Um, if um, if it is my, I myself who feel that something is, in my life is wrong but cannot make sense of my social experiences because my social world lacks the hermeneutical resources that would allow me to understand such experiences as a form of injustice of which I am victim. If it is I myself who does, n does not understand what happens to me, who is here the, perpetr the perpetrator of the injustice? Certainly not myself, uh, but who then? So can, can we trace the direct cognitive antecedent back to superalternism alone in this case? This, this is the question. Uh, uh, how do you think about these aspects of um, 
uh, strictly linked to hermeneutical injustice. Um, then I have a final question, who is um, maybe because I don't fully understand <laughs> some some things you have said. Um, um, I, I I have um, some difficulty following you with regard to your main thesis, namely that epistemic justice is impossible within a framework thought based on bivalent logic. And um, um, so I'm. I will try to explain why by raising two questions. Again, th these are questions just to provoke your reaction and and hear much more about you because uh, I think what what you're uh, bringing to us uh, today is very very important. So um, it, it seemed to me that you were criticizing the bivalent system, showing its limitation. Um, this is due to the de de determinism of the system, which limits uh, its expressive powers to two opposing poles and uh, does not conceive of other intermediate values. Uh, that is, listening to you, it, seems, it seemed to me that the narrowness of the bivalent system um, is that of not being able to grasp all aspects of reality but of classifying them each time into one of the two possible poles, yes or no, without perceiving intermediate nuances. If we, if we make this point, every time we reason according to a bivalent logic, we should also recognize that perhaps we are overlooking something, um, that there is something we are missing uh, that we cannot even see. I don't know if you agree with this uh, con implication consideration, but th this is how I interpreted you when, when, I, when I listened to you today. So if, if I understand you correctly, your basic argument is this. Um, if we are in a bivalent system, and if it is a system that produces epistemic injustice, how would its opposite, epistemic justice, be possible without contradiction invading the system? But to ask this question in these terms, is it not in turn to subscribe to a bivalent logic? I mean, if to, question, if to the question, is it possible that a system that heals epistemic injustice can also heal epistemic justice, we dryly answer no. We are ourselves answering from a bivalent logic that is a limited one that's that doesn't grasp all the nuances of reality. This, this would be a, a first, a first uh, perspective on, the, on, on my difficulties in following you. Um, the, the second one is, um, is uh, the following. Um, I perfectly agree with you when you say that epistemic injustice is not only an ethical problem, but also logical, ontological, methodological, psychological, etc. And I, I would also add political, above all. And yes, so uh, I think the, uh, the ethics of knowing of which Freaker speaks is necessarily also politics of knowing. And so to, to say that one thing is more just than another, or that one thing is unjust compared to another alternative is to exercise one's own judgment in practical life, right? Uh, the one that allows us to orient ourselves. Is all this supported by a bivalent logic? Yes, y y this is your answer. Um, but here, justice and injustice are, are never two abstract values. Um, it is the dimension of the contingency of judgment that we should come to think about. If, if we place ourselves in the dimension of the contingency of judgment, is it possible to argue that in a system where injustice is possible, justice would not be structurally possible? Uh, for instance, dialectical thinkers would say uh, the exactly uh, opposite. They would say it is precisely because injustice exists, pre precisely because it takes place, that justice becomes possible as an alternative choice, as a possibility to judge or to act otherwise. And obviously, not in absolute, 
but depending on the contextual factors each time considered, this is why it's a political issue um, also. I don't know whether these reflections uh, seem appropriate to you or whether they are completely, in French we say, a côté de la plaque, which means besides the point, <laughs> completely inadequate. So thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, uh, Professor Timaconum, I think you probably have a lot to say about this. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Angelo. Uh, you have raised quite a lot of things. And um, I will try to track and respond to as many of them as possible uh, that I can remember. So, uh, very interesting issues you raised. Uh, the first one uh, being um, uh, about the ontology that I say uh, lie at the foundation with logic and ontology dealing with realities. You wanted to know whether the scope of realities in question also accommodate symbols and uh, what type of realities that I have in mind here. Um, uh, I mean, the basic realities that uh, metaphysicians and ontologists study uh, in their individuated forms and in their, um, uh, in their wholeness, uh, the basic objects around uh, um, uh, and, and existence generally in different ways and shapes they come. And that will also include symbols insofar as the um, uh, indicators um, of meaning, things that signal or represent uh, something and make sense. Yes, I agree, it would include that. Um, but connecting that your second question, you, you, you wanted to know this frame of thought that I see that the uh, systematic functioning of logic and ontology makes up what I call frame of thought. You're asking whether it's something static or something that could change according to our predilections or maybe according to circumstances of life. Um, and I said, um, no, not in that sense. Um, uh, when uh, we look at reality, in a divisive and lopsided way, uh, we have some laws in logic that uh, justify that and present them, and present such a frame of thought as bivalence. And I made mention of excluded middle, as says that uh, um, a, a, a thing neither is, is or does not exist. And the law of contradiction and that are translated to the principles of bivalence and determinism, respectively stating that um, a proposition um, is either true or false, and that um, the proposition is either necessary or impossible, as the case may be. So when we have such a structure, and this, again, we must trace, uh, is a basic elementary formulation to the organon of Aristotle, some 300 years BC. Um, but it was actually a kind of logical representation of how people think. And uh, this type of thinking does, is not, does not have geographical limitation, as the case may be. People look left and right in Pretoria before they cross the motorway, and they do so in Washington, in Paris, in Tokyo, and everywhere. So um, bivalent frame of thought is, again, limited perhaps in its expressive power, but what it loses in terms of its expressive power, it gains in terms of precision, and which is its main advantage. However, um, it is not something that we can change or our circumstances of life can change. Uh, I don't, I, I, when, I, when I throw an apple up here, it will fall down. It doesn't matter whether I'm happy or sad or excited, it will still fall down. Um, so, so 
And that is why logic agglutinates principles of intelligibility that enable us to make sense of things in all fields and of life and, and, and study, the case may be. And then the third question you asked it was about um, um, the ideology of superalternism as a direct antecedent condition to epistemic injustice. And you raised, if you flagged a very important idea here, I must admit, you said that this is something that clearly works for the testimonial variant, but it doesn't look as if it's going to work for the hermeneutical variant. I agree on the first value, but if we probe uh, even the hermeneutical occurrence of epistemic injustice further, we will understand, come to realize that, uh, let's start with an example. Um, um, you know, at some at a point in countries like Uganda, Nigeria, uh, the concept of sexism was not well known. Okay, hermeneutical injustice could occur in this way if uh, people are regularly being uh, done wrong, experienced wrong. All right, and no one is crying out or aspiring to remedy all that simply because that critical concept is lacking in the collective interpretive uh, epistemic resource of uh, uh, such people. All right, fast forward to today, that critical concept of sexism exists. We know when an action or behavior or comment is sexist. Uh, this is also well known in Uganda, uh, even in Nigeria, okay, about then, these places continue to make laws against members of the LGBTQ community. I am not talking of just uh, people behaving in uh, committing acts of uh, hermeneutical injustice against people in this fashion, but even parliament making laws you know, against these people. So what do you call that? That indicates to us that there's a connection between a testimonial and hermeneutical epistemic in Justice is a delicate metaphysical connection um, uh, in the sense that um, the way people think, okay, um, uh, and, and which I trace from frame of thought to reversal and then super as an ideology itself, that is what, again, ensures that indirect, whether directly or indirectly, that critical concepts uh, epistemic resources that can ensure that hermeneutical injustices are not being perpetrated in a particular culture. It is the way people think that ensure that such concepts are not created in the first place. Okay, if you have come to a culture where people believe that um, that is, people believe that um, men are superior and women are inferior. That's enough to inhibit the development of a critical concepts such as sexism or, or other adjoining concepts that will flag actions and practices of hermeneutical injustice. Okay, now in this way, that is what superalternism embodies, even though it might not look as if it has direct connection with epistemic injustice of the hermeneutical kind as it does with the testimonial kind, uh, but. Uh, deeper thinking, as I have explained, shows that it does, okay? And um, however, I agree with you that this is a subject that requires further investigation and um, criticisms and fine tuning of the ideas we throw up in this uh, until we reach such a point that we are, you know, uh, very clear if, uh, on the things we pontificate. Okay, and then uh, you said, finally about epistemic injustice as uh, something that would be possible in a system that produces epistemic uh, injustice as the main thesis of my yes i agree that's what i said and um but that is when uh the bivalent system uh is naturally designed to produce marginal thinking like epistemic injustice, natural, that's what it does, because it's divisive and lopsided. It presents every vision of reality in that lopsided fashion, which is marginal. Epistemic injustice is just one of such. 
Um, um, uh, however, I agree that um, um, uh, what I have done is to indicate the weakness, the limitation of the bivalent frame of thought. All right. Uh, it does not mean that we cannot find a way to overcome epistemic injustice using different types of uh, other types of frame of thoughts. Uh, but my research did not get to that level. Perhaps it's something that would be of concern to me in future uh, inquiry. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I will think further about these comments that you have provided me and the questions and the ones that Nicole also provided me. I believe that they are going to enrich uh, the next work that I will do along this line. Thank you, colleagues. I appreciate that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Jonathan. Victoria. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Okay, um, this has been great, very dense. I see that everybody has a lot of questions and comments um, 